there's the narcissist and the codependent. So the, the codependent and the narcissist are like two, two halves to a whole. So it, it, let me explain to you. So let's say just typically narcissistic father, codependent mother is constantly biding for attention, approval from a kind of like a tyrant type of authoritarian father, maybe abusive emotionally, physically, and mom becomes emotionally dead. Her nervous system, and they're both, truth, truthfully, they're both traumatized souls who found one another repeating their childhood patterns, and here you are growing up in this environment where you wanted the attention and the approval to be seen and heard by mom, but because of their unhealthy, traumatic, trauma bond dynamic, mom becomes a narcissistic mother. So let me say this in a different way. Ooh, uh, what is up? Welcome, welcome, welcome. We have the very first trigger-proof transmission I have done in, I don't know how long, it seems like a couple months now. Um, we're simultaneously broadcasting right now at the Brain Care Club on Clubhouse, so I just have two texts going at the same time. If you're on Clubhouse right now, welcome. I invite you to join my Facebook group to watch this as a Facebook Live, um, just to get that added little bit of... Uh, uh, sensory experience, not just sound, but also uh, to be able to hear this uh, live. want to see if uh, people can hear me. Hopefully this is working. Uh, let me know if, uh, if it's working. And I really have been looking forward to this conversation. Doc usually I do a Friday room with Dr. Russ, but he was a little under the weather and he asked me to do this by myself. So I thought, what would be a really great topic for the peeps in this room and uh, in my community, Trigger Proof community. And uh, I just usually go by what the conversations have been like in my Cycle Breakers community. And it seems that codependency is a big one. And there are roles that we get into in relational dynamics that are frustrating, that feel horrible, that, I mean, if we can go, uh, if we can get really honest and... Um, truthful here that a lot of times people, uh, not only their health turns to shit from these really toxic relational dynamics, but also uh, people have died from it. Um, why am I talking about relationships? If you've never met me before, welcome. Welcome to my channel. Welcome to my podcast. Um, my name is Dr. Nima Romani and I'm a retired chiropractor who now helps people uh, break free from trauma bonds, heal their relational dynamics, and that go from insecure attachments to secure attachments. And the, what led me here was a sense of frustration throughout my chiropractic career where patients were coming in with stress-related issues. And after about 10, 15 years of getting to know people and the way that they uh, our resi uh, various degrees of resiliency towards stress, I discovered that people who were dealing with unconscious, insecure relational dynamics, uh, volatility, infidelity, divorce, separation, they suffered from ruptured attachments, what we called ruptured, any type of a ruptured attachment creates a internal state in the body of, of dysregulation. And for a lot of people causes a downward spiral in your health, in your mental well-being. And it was a last year actually, actually several months ago, a few months ago where we lost a good friend uh, to, you know, he, he was divorced and got involved in another trauma bonded type of relationship. And because of the drama that was involved in that, he took his own life. And you don't have to really look far. Most of us, if you've been following the Johnny Depp, Amber Heard uh, situation, you basically saw, you know, if you had popcorn in hand watching, uh, you're watching a trauma bond. It's, uh, it was just a train wreck. 
And there isn't a person alive that I know of that isn't able to look and watch that and not see a tiny little part of themselves in it, whether they see themselves in Johnny, whether they see themselves in Amber. What we're doing when we're watching uh, train wrecks like that is we're looking at reflections of our own shadow. And so whether you were glued to it and you couldn't stop watching or it was just um, you couldn't you couldn't bear watching it, it was because you were you were really uncomfortable or or fascinated by your own reflection. Either one is okay. I just I'm here uh, to help uh, expand on the truth. I want to help raise awareness of of these trauma bonds. I want to help raise awareness of how to heal and break them because experts say it's literally impossible. Experts say that codependency, you're it, you're in it for life. And I've been getting a lot of DMs in my Instagram from people who have codependency issues or saying coda isn't working for me. I'm ready to finally finally break the cycle. You know, how do I do this? And if you told me 10 years ago that I was going to be talking about codependency and trauma bonds, I would have laughed in your face because I was really into helping people heal from their past and create, you know, magical experiences in their lives, starting with their health as a chiropractor. That's my number one goal. Uh, but as I went deeper and I went upstream and healing my own trauma bonded relationship, uh, which ended about four years ago, the, the journey from that rock bottom place where the police were actually involved, me asking myself, how the fuck did I end up here? Uh, somebody who's intelligent, who's got a lot going for him. Uh, you know, I it's not like I had a, a, a shortage of possibility of who, you know, I could date, but here I am in this relationship that I just can't seem to get out of. And so when I'm watching Johnny and Amber, I'm looking and going, dude, I see you. I, it was it was uncomfortable for me to look at the reflection in myself with Johnny and and Amber and seeing how, you know, how could I have been so blind? How could I have stayed in a relationship that I knew was bad for both of us, that we weren't good for one another, but the, the pull was so strong uh, that you know, if I took a friend out for coffee and he asked me all of the same problems that I was personally going through, I would have had no problem telling him how to solve it. Easy peasy, right? It, logically, it didn't make sense. But when we're dealing with codependency and when we're dealing with trauma bonds, logic, you can throw it out the window. And I want to explain why that is and give you the five unconscious roles that we play unconsciously, I keep saying unconsciously because it's not intentional. It's not something that um, it's anybody's fault. And I want to start a disclaimer by saying that nowhere am I blaming anyone. This is not a fault game. But I want to uh, say that in, in healing, in healing trauma bonds, we have to get rid of the word fault and blame if we actually want to heal. And it's a very controversial topic. This pisses pisses people off. I get accused of uh, of being a what's I, I get accused of being a, a victim blamer uh, quite a bit. So uh, I want to make sure that that's not happening here in this conversation. I have my notes here, and I'm going to make some notes of the five types, and I'm going to go into it, and then go into why trauma bonds happen, why these roles that we unconsciously fall into make perfect sense, and how we can start to unpack it. And so if there's anyone uh, who has questions uh, and would like to jump on, uh, on, a, on a question on stage here in... Uh, Clubhouse, I'd love to field their questions, but here it is, and I'm writing them down for those of you wanting to jump on uh, Facebook Live in my community. I, I'm writing it all down. The first role that we play is the caregiver. I'm right. Caregiver. In codependency and unconscious dynamics, this caregiver role is kind of like taking care of your partner's needs, but really avoiding working on your own. And that's one of the roles that we take on uh, as in, our, in these codependent dynamics. You can see it all the time where somebody says, yeah, my, my, my partner has this illness. Uh, 
my partner has an addiction, my partner has something going on, uh, and the codependent has the uh, their partner, they're completely caregiving, but burning themselves out, becoming exhausted mentally, emotionally, physically. Sometimes you'll even see them get health issues, crisis, health crisis, inflammatory bowel, uh, Crohn's disease, um, uh, what do they call it, uh, fibromyalgia. These are all kind of uh, chronic illness, chronic pain of the co that the codependent, this is what I would see in my practice, that the codependents get uh, as it's kind of like the child inside screaming and saying, what about me? All right, what about me? So these chronic illnesses, without getting this right and healing from this, this is where a lot of chronic illness and chronic pain comes in when you've been doing the caregiver role uh, in in codependency and your body just gives gives out. That's number one. Number two role is the fixer. So the first one is caregiver. The second role is the fixer. And the fixer is when you're doing everything you can to fix or change your partner while conveniently forgetting to take care of yourself. And this is another role that we play. There's caregiver, there's a fixer. So it's like, hmm, I'm going to fix this person. You know, you go in there knowing they have an addiction, they have a health crisis, They're, they are in some sort of need of a, like a parent figure, lo and behold, you jump in and you take on that fixer role. That's one of the unconscious roles in codependency. We're gonna talk about where this all comes from, but that's another role. Let me know if you see yourself in any of these. Let me know if you were in, in your current relationship or a past relationship and if these roles seem to be popping up for you, because I'm gonna talk a little bit about where this comes from. So that's number two. Number three, number three is the supporter. The supporter role is when you'll support and encourage your partner's preferences, goals, and, and dreams, even if you're not receiving support yourself. This is the key. I mean, my wife is a great supporter of me. I'm a great supporter of my wife, but it's a mutual one. Right there's a mutual supporting role, and that's really a great. That's I think what 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 a, a healthy relationship should have. It's not bad that you're being support. You're being supportive. The distinction here I want you to invite you. I'm inviting you to look at is, are you receiving that as well? And if not, you're just taking on that role, and even it's like been five years, ten years, whatever, but it's not being returned this is one of the unconscious roles that you might be playing in your trauma bond. And I'm gonna to explain to you where that comes from. Number four, in just a minute, I'm just gonna go over the five first and then I'm gonna kind of back it up a little bit. Number five is the confidant. The confidant and what, oh, can't really see it here. Let me just put this this way here so you can kind of see a little bit better there. There you go. So the conf, because I'm wearing a white t-shirt here. The confidant is when you're listening. It's when you're listening to what your partner shares, but you share very little about yourself and you're not actually bothered or turned off by the fact that the other person doesn't really listen or ask anything about you. This is the confidant role that many kind of fall into in, in these unconscious relationship patterns. So the caregiver, number one, the fixer, number two, the supporter, number three, number four is the confidant. And what's number five? Number five is the enabler. The enabler, what is the enabler? The enabler is when you really don't have any boundaries or stand up for yourself, uh, allowing you to be treated, allowing yourself to be basically treated like shit as long as your partner or friend, 
because this actually works with friendships too. If you haven't noticed, you can fall into these exact same roles with friendships. As long as what? As long as they don't leave you. Because being alone is worse for you than to be in a shitty enabling type of relationship where you're treated like absolute shit. All right, now, each one of us have experienced various degrees of this. Number one, caregiver. Number two, fixer. Number three, supporter. Number four, confidant. And number five, enabler. I'm curious to know which of these you fall under. Does this resonate with you? Does, this, um, does that land for you at all? This is where codependency comes in. And so in order to, to, to heal this, we really have to go back and ask ourselves the question, you know, where does this all begin? And codependency, if you really look at it, um, it begins in childhood. It's a, it's a repetition. Freud calls it the repetition compulsion. It is when we compulsively repeat the relational dynamics that were uh, contextually set up for us in childhood. So it's, it's, a re, it's a repetition of a childhood situation. So if you had a mother and a father, usually it's because mom and dad's relationships were codependent. So let's say you have dad and you have mom, okay? Mom, let's say, I'm just, it can go both ways, right? So the, there's the narcissist and the codependent. So the, the codependent and the narcissist are like two, two halves to a whole. So it, it, let me explain to you. So let's say just typically narcissistic father, codependent mother is constantly biting for attention, approval from a kind of like a tyrant type of authoritarian father, maybe abusive emotionally, physically, and mom becomes emotionally dead her nervous system, and they're both, truth, truthfully, they're both traumatized souls who found one another repeating their childhood patterns, and here you are growing up in this environment where you wanted the attention and the approval to be seen and heard by mom, but because of their unhealthy, traumatic, trauma bond dynamic, mom becomes a narcissistic mother. So let me say this in a different way. The codependent in the relationship, fathers, let's say he's narcissistic, mom is codependent, then mother becomes the narcissistic mother. And a narcissistic mother doesn't really have empathy for the child. The child becomes a tool, a, 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 an ego, a, like an extension of the ego of the parent. And the child doesn't individu isn't allowed to individuate, isn't allowed to have their own preferences, needs, desires. Um, and because of the insecure dynamic with mom and mom isn't really there and she's emotionally dead, the child, you, in that dynamic, what happens? Well, this experience of not feeling seen and loved for who you are as a child is very upsetting to, to the younger you. And this rage starts to develop. This inner rage starts to develop in the child, but there's a conflict in the child because in order for us as, a, as children, we feel the rage of having to work for love, having to, to, to perform for love, having love be experienced as conditional, that's maddening to a child. But as children, we can't express our rage to mom. So what do we do? Well, we internalize that rage. And the child creates this persona. There's two solutions in that, with that wound of not feeling seen by an emotionally dead mother. There's two um, solutions. The first solution is codependency is the child then says, okay, I'm going to put my needs aside and I'm going to be the good girl. I'm going to be the good boy. I'm going to do exactly what mommy and daddy want me to be. And I'm going to be whoever they want me to be so that I can get the maximum attention, maximum approval. And so the child learns to kind of manipulate their character and put on various different masks, whatever we need, whatever we can to get our needs met. Boom, 
And here we have it. That's codependency. And so as a child, if you had been conditioned to that love was something you have to work for, that love is not something you just deserve, that you're not worthy and deserving of it without having to perform, without having to pretend or get sick or get hurt or get injured for it, the wiring in your system starts to experience, ah, so I have to work for it. I have to become a different person. I have to hide who I am. I have to suppress my truth or get sick and injured in order to get my needs met. Well, what does your nervous system do in your, late, in your later years? This is why I would see many codependents get sick and injured because that's the only way they felt that they could learn to receive love. So anyone who has chronic pain and chronic illness would come to my office as a chiropractor. This is why I'm teaching this stuff. And I would see they've been trying, they've gone to 20 different doctors, 20 different specialists, which is by the way, a, a transference of a parent figure that they didn't receive love from. As ch children, we then transfer it onto doctors. Sometimes that was me and I'd be like, like this person's constantly getting themselves sick and injured there's something deeper going on. It's not really their elbow issue. It's not really their back problem. There's an unconscious emotional component. I couldn't figure it out until I figured it out. And then that's when I retired from chiropractic and this is what I teach. It's so, you know, it's so kind of inherently tied together with childhood attachment trauma and your health. Without getting this right, you're just kind of staying in this familiar role the fixer, the confidant, you're staying in these roles, getting sick, going from doctor to doctor, a victim of the system, not really learning that this all comes from the identity that your childhood self received because of a mother uh, and that was emotionally dead because of her codependency. And then that was downloaded onto you. See how it works as a cycle. So it's not your fault, it was just the identity that you received as a child. Now, that child who didn't receive love, emotion, and get, didn't get their emotional needs met, there was emotional neglect, there was physical violence, there was emotional abuse, and this is small T trauma. Big T trauma is physical violence, sexual violence. We already know that that's a big thing, but very few people, really get that not getting your emotional needs met or being told, stop crying, that didn't happen. Um, being, being told, we wish that you were a boy. Your mother, your, your father and I were really hoping for boys. Why couldn't you be more like so-and-so? That's kind of like death by a million paper cuts because it's not overtly violent, but what happens is these little microaggressions, they really cut through the soul of the child. And the child then abandons them. The child doesn't learn to um, hate their parent. What they do is they internalize that rage and they go inward. And so these depressive disorders, these long-term chronic depressive disorders is displaced rage from mom and dad internally. They don't hate mom and dad, they learn to hate themselves we learn to hate ourselves. And so this internal rage becomes chronic pain and chronic illness later on. It's all attachment trauma. Solution number one from this lack of emotional attunement, this experience of having to work for love becomes codependency. Now, the same wound has an exact opposite solution. My name is Dr. Nima Romani, and you've been listening to The Trigger Proof, designed to teach you the most important skill necessary for a dramatically changing world, which is nervous system regulation. And becoming trigger proof doesn't mean trigger less, it means learning how to regulate ourselves to bring us back to center so that we can then be governed by our purpose rather than from our wounds. Anytime there's reactivity, 
there's a wound. And if you're curious and inspired to learn more, join us at Breathwork and Badassery or the Overview Experience. There's a difference between listening to a podcast and actually showing up live and doing the work with a badass community who's all about breaking cycles of intergenerational trauma. It didn't start with you, but it can end with you if you're willing to do the work. See you at the next perfect time. It's called narcissism. When the child didn't get their emotional needs met, immediately they create a false self, a grandiose self. I'm going to be the best. I'm going to be grandiose. I'm going to rule the world. I'm going to take over the planet. Right? And so this creates a fantasy false self, just like the codependent creates many false selves. Whoever she needs to be or he needs to be to get their needs met, the narcissist with the same wounding creates is narcissism is a different solution to that same wound, which is I'm going to be the best, the grandest, the top of the line. Right. And so this puffed up and inflated sense of self is all to compensate for this deep feeling of insignificance, which is shared by the codependent. So now we have the narcissist and the codependent with the exact, our two solutions to the exact same wound. And so unconsciously without healing at the root cause, which is at the somatic base level, we then go into relationships. We choose partners with very similar wounds and the narcissist and the codependent are like two halves to a whole, soulmates, twin flames. It's like, it's like I've known you all my life, exactly. Because what will happen is the narcissist will love bomb in the first stage is the love bombing stage where they tell you you're so amazing you're the most beautiful you're the, you're the you're the you're the top of the line and that as a codependent because your self-worth is so low you think that you fell in love with the the narcissist but in fact you've fallen in love with an idealized version of yourself so there's co-pedestalization co-idealization going on where you've actually fallen in love with yourself. <laughs> so the codependent all of a sudden feels, oh my God, I'm significant. I can fix this person. My love, my love will set them free. I will love them. I will love them into their healing. And my love will give them hope and healing. And then one day they're going to return the favor back to me, which is kind of a covert form of narcissism. If you take a look, I'm an empath. I'm an empath which is another form of grandiosity and covert narcissism. So you see there's a reflection. The narcissist and the codependent are reflections of one another. The narcissist is a covert codependent because the narcissist, while they're walking around with their grandiosity, they are highly codependent on their supply, sex, services, and supply, which is validation, the validation that the codependent gives you. The narcissist can't live without it. Right. And then the codependent is a covert narcissist, which, you know, you might think, oh, my God, what are you saying? You might say, fuck you, Nima, for saying that. I'm not. Well, take a look. You know, when you look at codependency, there's a lot of manipulation going on and hiding your truth and and being who you want to be so that you can get external validation. So you see the reflections. And the reason why I'm saying this is not to blame you. It's not to make you wrong. It's to help you actually break the cycle. Because the only way to break this cycle is to acknowledge that it didn't start with you. That this is something that uh, begins from childhood. And it's very difficult. I mean, the experts will say that it's next to impossible. And I've worked with many people with this. And I can vouch for that because many people jump in and they say, I'm ready to do this. I'm ready to break the cycle. But to, um, you know, and, and, and one of the big kind of fundamental blocks is that uh, they start the, the the biggest challenge for codependence is when you start the healing work when people come into our programs 
they say they're ready to break the cycle and heal, but deep down inside, they're doing it to get the other person back. And that inauthentic kind of raison of raison d'etre of, of doing the work always ends up shooting you in the foot because the only way out, the reason for this whole game is uh, a lack of self-love and an intolerance to guilt. So in order to break the cycle, you got to be willing to be the bad guy and say, and choose yourself. But the problem is if you formed an identity as a child in being a slave, in being the good person, to choose yourself is, is, goes violently against your identity. And so it's actually worse than an addiction. So it's really difficult. And without the right guidance, without the right commitment, it will, without a doubt, you'll fall into old patterns of fixer, of, of rescuer, of supporter, of confidant, of enabler and caregiver, because quite frankly, who would you be without this identity? So to go and talk about it with a therapist or a counselor or a social worker doesn't actually heal it. To heal it, one must actually choose another identity. And the biggest obstacle is if you've formed an identity as a slave who has who who feels like oh my gosh to choose myself makes me the bad guy and that that actually is intolerable to me you're going to choose the trauma bond over your freedom every time because freedom means i'm a bad person and that will elicit toxic shame and you'll do you'd rather kill yourself than to be a bad person and we see this all the time you know people die in trauma bonds where things get so violent, things get so volatile that people get hurt, suicides, uh, homicides, guaranteed trauma bonds are involved. So this is a really important um, purpose that I have. This is a very meaningful cause. And so in our Cycle Breakers Collective and Portal programs, we help people who are actually truly, truly ready to commit to breaking that cycle that didn't start with them. Because truth, truth be told, this problem that you're having in your trauma bonded relationship, it's not about them. It's about the unhealed parts of yourself as a child. And what we do is we don't actually work with people and we don't even focus on couples work. And the worst part is when, when we're working with codependents and they're like, well, he does this and he, he, he. And we're like, uh, what about you? <laughs> it so goes against the identity of choosing yourself that people just feel like it's actually worse than, than healing an addiction. <laughs> it's an identity as a slave that you've taken on as a child that you don't really know anything different. So unfortunately, many people die because of this. And so I'm here because I want to reach one or two people who are finding themselves in this story and have kids and your children are watching these dynamics and your children are seeing this codependent dynamic going on and what they're doing is their nervous systems are getting information of how relationships should be done. And I wanna help break the cycle for people because this is where anxiety comes in. This is where depression comes in. This is where chronic pain comes in. This is where injuries come in. This is where um, suicides happen. This is where mental illness thrives. And it's all because of trauma bonds. And I want to dissolve the stigma. I want to dissolve the shame because it's not anyone's fault. But it's your responsibility. And there is a way to heal. And the way that we do it to break that cycle, there's five pillars. And I'll go over them briefly, but this is basically what we talk about is the first one is mastering the nervous system, mastering regulation of the nervous system, understanding how to self-assess and how to move yourself up the autonomic ladder into safety. Because if we don't learn how to self-assess and understand our nervous system, we'll be dissociated and checked out and 
not able to feel and using sedatives and getting into these drama cycles of push-pull dynamics just to feel shit because we're so dissociated. We work with people who have uh, chronic dorsal or dissociation patterns of checking out and leaving their body. And because they do that, sometimes getting into these volatile arguments is the, their only way to feel anything. And that's when it, things get dangerous. That's when you have trips to the hospital. That's when accidents happen. And this is, you know, this is when shit gets dangerous. And just look at your upbringing. Look at what you saw with your parents. And now look at what your children are experiencing with you. They're registering what a normal relationship is. And that's why I'm so passionate about teaching this to people because, you know, we got to break the cycle. <laughs> I'm talking to people who are like, I want to be a cycle breaker. And being a cycle breaker is hard because it takes somebody who uh, is willing to learn how to auto be, become the, the active operator of their own nervous system, right? Rather than making the other person fix it. Oh, I'm going to get into this other person, uh, this relationship so that then I can feel calm and safe. I'm going to find safety outside of myself. No, no, no. A cycle breaker actually says, no, I'm going to be, I'm going to be the active operator. I'm going to stop using my relationship for my own kind of emotional regulation. The second pillar of healing this is uh, clearing our past resentments, resentments, regrets, all the shame that we're carrying and guilt. We don't really understand how to tolerate it and how to create safety within that because nobody taught us how to work with our emotions, usually codependent and borderline type of, uh, and also narcissism, people who are, are constantly dysregulated because they're holding on to so much anger, resentment, guilt, and shame. That we're holding on to all of them. We, we don't know how to dissolve them. We don't know how to clear them. We don't know how to create an expanded capacity for them. So we carry them like rocks in our backpack. Without doing this work, any type of personal development work becomes just kind of like a cognitive bypass or a bliss bypass. Oh, everything's fine. Toxic positivity. Just think positive. Just look at all these beautiful memes on social media and your health starts keeps turn, turning to shit. You keep getting into these volatile push-pull dynamics, hoping one day that everything's going to be happy. And that's just a fucking fantasy. And we see it every day and it's heartbreaking that this is how it is, but it doesn't have to be that way. Pillar number three is learning how to dance with our shadow, our dark passenger. This is shadow integration. We have these really dark, insignificant, like painful, insignificant, shameful parts of ourselves that keep popping up every time we get triggered. And we don't know what to do with it. We let the shadow, when we don't really learn how to dance with this dark passenger, the shadow takes over and we're run by our addictions and we start creating drama cycles because we just get high off of it. We get addicted to that emotional cycle. And without doing that work, a safe relationship feels boring. We'll be like, well, this is boring. I don't have to work for love. This person really wants to be there for me. Must be something wrong with them, right? And then that gets passed down to our kids. Pillar number four is empathic communication. Got to learn this really nasty inner critic that's been beating us up, which is part of the con, um, you know, the uh, complex post-traumatic stress from childhood attachment wounds. This enters into our mind and the voice of our inner critic is the voice of mom or dad. And we start beating ourselves up worse than anyone else does. And so when we're beating ourselves up, we then get into abusive situations and tolerate it because it's a reflection of how we feel towards ourselves. Now, I'm not saying it's your fault. I'm just saying the way that we're treated is a reflection of how we're treating ourselves. None of it's our fault. And so changing that with the fourth pillar, which is empathic communication, you're able to change that narrative and that dialogue with ourselves and we're able to communicate our desires to others in a way that it's received and we can receive a mutual loving receiving type of relationship. Without doing that properly, 
we're constantly beating ourselves up, run by guilt and shame, and then we deliberately get ourselves, unconsciously by the way, get ourselves in these really shitty dynamics as a reflection of how we're treating ourselves. As within, so without. And the fifth one is the most important, which is commitment and community. Why? Because it's like weight loss. You're not going to want to do it. Giving up your identity as a slave is probably the most difficult thing that you're going to want to do. You're going to want to give up a hundred times. But to have people who care, guides, coaches, mentors say, hey, where, where have you been? It's been a while since you've been to the calls. Are you going back to that old pattern? And usually, you know, with addiction, everybody, everyone who's uh, in addiction, everybody lies. So we see it all the time and it's unfortunate, uh, but it's a part of the job that we do. I take it on wholeheartedly because I believe in the work we're doing to break these cycles. But, you know, you got to work with people who can catch you in your egoic lies and try to, that are trying to cover up the shame that we have towards ourselves because deep down inside, you're not going to want to give up the old identity. It is terrifying. It's, it's hands down the most difficult work that one can do is to be a cycle breaker. Nine out of 10 people who apply to work with us aren't actually qualified because it's so ingrained and entrenched. The ones who we do take on is the ones who we feel really are committed because Giving up an old identity is really difficult. The best example that I can give you is like watching the show Shawshank Redemption. If you've ever seen that show, you see this guy, uh, there's a scene in it, uh, his name is Brooks, okay? And he's this old man who was has been in prison his entire life. He was just a kid when he was in jail and now he's an old man. And so he gets freed. Right. And all of a sudden you'd think he'd be happy. He's like, woohoo, Brooks, you're free. Congratulations. You're, 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 you're released from prison. So he goes out into the real world where now he doesn't recognize the world. It's been five, six decades. He's been in, j in jail, incarcerated. And he goes out in the real world and tries to get a job and tries to go on the bus. And he just doesn't really like his life there. So he, he even tried to uh, he even thought, he was talking about it, he thought of um, committing another crime so that he can get tossed back in jail. Uh, and so eventually, if you watch the show, it's a really heartbreaking scene. Highly recommend you watch that show. Eventually, what ends up happening is he commits suicide because he's like, I don't want my freedom. I, like I, This world, this life isn't for me. And breaking from trauma bonds and healing codependency actually works the same way. Um, the people say they want out, they say they want to heal, but nine out of 10 actually don't. It's heartbreaking. Nine out of 10 unconsciously want to get pulled back into that old dynamic because it's all they've ever known. Like Brooks, they've, it's, um, Morgan Freeman's character called it, what did he called it? Uh, institutionalization. You've been institutionalized. So that's why the experts say codependency can't be healed, but we have found that it can with the right type of person. So that was my message for today was about the five um, unconscious roles so that you could maybe see yourself in it. And then maybe one or two of you who are really inspired to transform it and are committed, you're coachable, you're resourceful, and you're you know, want to break that cycle so that your children don't end up in the same boat as you, those are the people that I would love to chat with. And if you're watching and you haven't already, um, the best way to kind of figure this out and get started is if you go on my um, Instagram link in bio, I have an attachment style quiz, which tells you where you are. Most codependents are in the anxious attachment or the avoidant attachment, or you could be disorganized. Either way, it all comes from childhood patterning. To heal it, it's not easy. Talk therapy, talking to a therapist doesn't do it because it's a pattern that's wired in your nervous system. So unless we had kind of address it at a nervous system level, you're just going to keep repeating that pattern. So I'm curious to see who is really inspired and seeing the impact and feeling so exhausted, you're anxious, you're depressed, you can't see 
the next, like it's now in the recording of this June the 3rd, you want to, by Christmas time, have a situation where you're surrounded by a love that's mutual. Those are the people, because it takes time. Those are the people that I'm interested in talking with. I'm gonna put a link down below. And uh, any questions you have, I'm happy to take you on. And um, thank you for checking this out. I'm gonna invite anybody who's on, uh, on Clubhouse to ask a question. Go ahead and raise your hand if you have a question. I would love to take you on and uh, maybe help you through this and see if nobody has any questions then. All right. Anybody, anybody, I'll give you five, a countdown of five. If somebody wants to raise their hand, I'll maybe coach you through a question. If nobody has a question. All right. We have somebody. Okay. Cabell. Kabe. Come on up. Christina. Hello. Christina, go ahead and, and ask your question, my dear. Go ahead and unmute yourself. Are you there? Christina, do you want to hit that unmute button? Oh, she maybe got, got scared. Anybody else? Sometimes people freak out. Does anyone have any questions about this? Did this land for you? Curious what your biggest takeaway was. Oh, you're back. Christina, you're back. Hello. Can you hear this? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Are you there? I'm not sure if it's me or it's you. Does anyone hear her? Christina, are you there? I'm here. Can't, can't see. All right. Looks like it's not working. Okay, it looks it might just be me. Hold on. Give me one second. It's me. It's not you, it's me, Christina. Try it again, my dear. Are you there? You can try it again. It wasn't you, it was me. I wasn't plugged in. I'm here now. You want to try again, Christina? I'd love to field your question if you're there. There you are. Go ahead and unmute. Here I am. Can you there hear you. Me? I can hear you now. Uh, that was me, not you. Oh, good. All right. Um, thank you for holding this room. It was really interesting. Cool. Um, I had a question um, as far as I've been trying to, uh, been working with a coach and trying to get out of my head and more into my body when I make decisions. Um, but I'm having a hard time feeling what's going on in my body. What, like, even if I'm trying to be actively and aware of what's going on in my body, I, I still don't feel much of anything. Yeah. So I was wondering if you had any suggestions. Mm -hmm. What you're experiencing there, um, uh, Christina, it's actually very common. Um, it's, it, it's in the autonomic nervous system. When you understand the autonomic nervous system, it's called, uh, the dorsal freeze, dorsal shutdown. So when you were a child, this is very common, when you're a child and you experienced trauma that's too fast, too much, too soon, what'll happen is you will kind of find safety in leaving your body, right? And so to have big feelings, your kind of knee-jerk reaction is to leave your body and escape up into your head. This is where somatic type of work uh, actually works. This is where it's a practice. This is where no therapist can do this for you. Uh, I see somebody mentioning, I think it was Glenn mentioning um, about psych psychiatry. Um, psychiatrists don't have this this training either. It's actually on uh, somatics, somatic therapy. Um, you know, I'm getting my training in somatic experiencing and it is a progressive practice. It's kind of like you know, building muscle to be able to learn to create safety within your own body. And these are tools and techniques that you can learn in how to expand your tolerance for discomfort. This is the key to trauma healing that many psychotherapists, psychiatrists haven't yet caught up in. Um, 
which is really an understanding of the polyvagal theory. And understanding the polyvagal theory sh shares that when we get triggered, our nervous system goes into a protective mode and the, the most primitive one is like we go into a freeze response. And that freeze response happens where, you know, if you're a child and you're experiencing too much pain or it was just unbearable, uh, you just kind of check out. You leave your body and you go into outer space and you just, you know, that's the, you go into a freeze response, right? And this is one of the most difficult things to deal with. Uh, because boom, you check out and they prolonged, they call it depression, but I don't believe it that it's depression. It's just a dorsal vagal shutdown that's been prolonged. And so our work, all of our work, your work, Christina, is to learn how to expand your tolerance and capacity for discomfort. That's really the key to healing trauma is expanding our tolerance to discomfort, which our biggest obstacle is, it's what we want to avoid. We, we've spent so much time trying to avoid it. So your work would be to find a guide and a community that encourages you with somatic-based practices that actually encourage you to get back into your body. And this is why we, we include that in all of our trainings because you know, you can go to a therapist every week, but whenever you get triggered, Christina, you check out and go into your head or you your soul just leaves your body and you go into a freeze response. Um, there's not much that will land. So a big part of the beginning of your healing will be just not talking, but just learning how to feel. And healing trauma is not about feeling better, but getting better at feeling, feeling shitty things, feeling sadness, feeling anger, feeling guilt, feeling shame without leaving our body. And so that's skill that uh, all of us are, are wise to learn and no one can do it for us. Does that make sense? It does. And I really like how you said that too, um, where it's, you're not... You're learning just to feel deeper, basically. That's Correct, exactly. And and it, there's a huge challenge there, Christina, because number one, it's really hard. It's a lot easier said than done. Number two, we can never do this alone, right? It's got to be, it, you got to have a, a safe container with you who can actually move you in and, 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 and actually have you hold space for those tears, for your sadness, for your anger, right? And psychiatrists, psychologists, counselors, they might be, you know, uh, book trained, but the problem is that they doesn't necessarily mean that they themselves have gone there and integrated their own shadows. So if they haven't felt it and they haven't moved through those emotions, then whoever you choose as your guide can only guide you as far as they themselves have gone. So you want to make sure you find a guide in a community that could help you move past your freeze and, and be prepared that there's no finish line with this. This is ongoing practice. So it's really learning a tool, learning tools rather than assuming that someone's going to kind of heal you and there's going to be a finish line with it. So it's an ongoing work in progress. Awesome. I appreciate it. Thanks. Beautiful. Yeah, absolutely. Great question. Very, very common. Um, are there any other questions? That That is one of the biggest challenges in healing codependency and stuff because this is really post-traumatic stress, right? Um, it's, it's called dissociation. What you're describing is called dissociation. And so this is the child inside of us that, you know, we have dissociated from we have cut away from because it was too painful. And our intolerance to emotions like guilt and shame are what keep us locked into trauma bonds. So healing from trauma bonds means getting good at feeling guilt, getting good at feeling shame, sometimes being perceived as the bad guy. You know, it's like, oh my gosh, I'm gonna leave this relationship. I, I can't leave this relationship because of the guilt. I, I'm gonna be perceived as the bad guy. And if that person thinks of me as the bad guy, I can't live with myself. So I'm gonna stay in that horrible relationship, whereas I'm gonna be perceived that way. And healing trauma is really about allowing our inside voice to be more profound and uh, more uh, 
louder than outside voices because one of the symptoms of unresolved trauma is um, having such a preoccupation with what other people think of us. And so it's scary. It's scary to have somebody say that we're not good people. How dare you leave me? You know, that's what kept me locked into my trauma bond for about three years, two years, uh, I'd say two years longer than I was in because I didn't want to be the bad guy. Because I knew that if I left, that would trigger her abandonment wounds and there would be a heavy consequence to pay. And so I stayed because <laughs> I didn't want to be the bad guy. And eventually I became the villain. And so I realized that just from helping so many people through this process who don't, who don't want to leave because, oh my gosh, that means I'm going to be the bad guy, right? And so um, you got to be willing to choose yourself, <laughs> which is terrifying to somebody with codependency. You got to be willing to go back there and resolve those attachment wounds that we've been carrying. We got to actually be willing to create a whole new identity. And because that's terrifying, because who would we be without that identity? In all likelihood, the majority of people stuck in codependency will be there for the rest of their lives. But I'm really inspired to work with those like uh, Jen, who was stuck in this trauma bonded situation and just by going in and healing at a nervous system level was not only able to break free from that trauma bond with somebody who was using her financially uh, and cheating on her, but also um, she was able to go off her mood stabilizers, you know, because she was learned how to self-regulate. Um, Mari, who was stuck in this codependent relationship with a narcissist who she just was like, I, I can't leave him because he's, he's just, he's threatened suicide. He's threatened suicide if I do. So I just, I don't want to be the bad guy. And by going in and doing the work, she was able to, it wasn't easy, was able to step away and finally choose herself. And now she's on a new path, meeting some new, met somebody else who's new who's a great person and now is able to have an authentic relationship because now it's based on fair exchange where she's not the fixer or the rescuer. And um, this also reminds me, uh, and all of them had tried tons of therapy, psychotherapy, medication, they've done it all. They usually come to our uh, offers as a last resort, very um, skeptical because they're like, how is this going to be any different? When the truth is, is that we go at a nervous system level and we help break the cycle. It doesn't, it, it was got nothing to do with your partner. It all has to do with our unresolved attachment wounds. And so we have the tools for that. We go into the body, get you to face your fears and to expand your capacity to feel your fear, your angst, your um, shame, your guilt, and feel safe within yourself because you're not scared of feelings anymore. It's essentially, most people are just terrified of feelings like guilt and shame because it, 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 it evokes, because nobody taught us that as a child, how to feel them. So just by increasing your capacity to feel them and being able to get from dissociation back in your body, you're able to break the cycle and it's worth it because the pain that you go through in order to become that person uh, you get to experience life with relationships that are secure. I don't think that there's anything more important to me personally than that. I can have all the money in the world, all the success, but if I don't feel safe in my own skin and be able to have relationships that feel authentic where I'm not pining after someone, where I'm not begging for breadcrumbs, where I'm not um, trying to perform for love, uh, life is not worth living <laughs> unless we we have relationships where that feel like you know unconditionally loving as a reflection of the love that we have learned how to give ourselves that's what it all comes down to the root cause is a lack of self-love and there's a dire consequence from health issues to insecure attachments to suicide and homicides that i see that we've seen so this message is super duper important and i'm really inspired to work with the cycle breakers in our community. So the invitation for anyone uh, is to uh, reach out and send a DM and uh, apply to actually break those cycles and learn how to live without anxiety, learn how to live feeling purposeful, learn how to live 
uh, being able to set boundaries, learn how to live not tolerating breadcrumbs and relationships that feel secure, that feel safe, uh, that are mutual. Sending you all love and see you at the next perfect time. Make sure you subscribe.